Welcome to today's broadcast of Practically Political, where pragmatists talk real politics. I'm Dave Spencer, founder of Practically Republican, and we have another very special guest today. Howard Feynman is the global editorial director of the Huffington Post Media Group. And prior to his move to the Huffington Post, he was Newsweek's chief political correspondent, senior editor, and deputy Washington bureau chief. Having been covering national politics for four decades means that he has been prowling the corridors in Washington through 11 administrations. Howard, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. An obvious place to start our conversation is the issue of Russian meddling in the 2016 election and the communication between members of the Trump administration with Russian officials. Much as the White House would like this story to go away, it's gathering greater momentum. Do you see this Russian scandal as a potential tipping point for the administration? Well, I don't think it's a tipping point yet, but I do think it's a story that's not going to go away anytime soon. Attorney General Sessions said that he would recuse himself from uh, any participation in whatever investigation there is by the Justice Department and the FBI of the whole story of Russia's involvement in the campaign and whether that involved the Trump campaign as well. And the Attorney General made a statement and then held a brief press conference at which I think he raised more questions than he answered. I thought he was forthright, but what he said raised questions. In other words, He said that he would not take part in any investigation because he had been part and parcel of the campaign. But if he was part and parcel of the campaign when he was a senator, uh, why didn't he answer the question that uh, he was asked in his confirmation about meeting with the Russian ambassador as part of the campaign? And that was only one of many questions that emerged. So I think that's going to give life to the story and not snuff it out. And the other issue is, too, just with Michael Flynn, even though we just found out about conversations with the Russians, how long did the administration know about these conversations before we did? Well, at least for a while, because uh, certainly before the Washington Post story, I think, because Mr. Sessions said that he had already initiated days ago, if not weeks ago, a discussion with the ethics people at the Justice Department about whether he should, in fact, recuse himself from any supervision of uh, an investigation of Trump and the Russians. So I don't know if the topic of those meetings came up when he was talking to the ethics people. I can't imagine that somebody in the counsel's office over at the White House didn't know about it. Donald Trump said very specifically that uh, he didn't know anything about the fact that Sessions had met with the Russian ambassador. That brings up really another key issue with Donald Trump and really the bellicose and frankly indefensible position postulated by this president that the media is the enemy of the American people. And as a veteran political journalist, I know you've heard this slant before, but how do you view this illogical campaign that the White House has been waging? Well, I think it's unfortunate all the way around. Did the political press corps miss the rise of Donald Trump and underestimate his potential as a candidate? Absolutely, yes. Uh, That makes us dumb, but not an enemy. So, I mean, I think he's got a bone to pick on the quality of our coverage, which wasn't very good in many cases. Uh, And nobody would know that better than he. I give him credit for that. But there's a long way from uh, talking about whether we were hanging around focusing on the wrong people. It's a long way from that to accuse us of being un-American, and not only un-American, but traitors to the American people. And and that's not the kind of thing I've heard anywhere from anybody. Even Richard Nixon, when he was caught on tape calling the press the enemy, was saying that the press was the enemy of the Nixon administration, not the American people. So I think it's rhetorically way over the top and outrageous. But I also think it's the duty of the press corps not to get down in the mud with Donald Trump and instead to just carefully, ploddingly, and calmly do our jobs. And one of the things we need to do is look at whatever role the Russians played in American politics in 2016, the hacking, the leaking, the influencing, and whether any of that, which was designed to hurt Hillary Clinton and benefit Donald Trump, was known by or participated in by the Trump campaign. It's certainly a very logical question. We shouldn't use the word traitor, and we shouldn't call each other enemies of the people. We should just go about and do our business. I think that part of the administration's strategy is there's all this stuff going on with the tweets. That's a distraction. I think we need to focus on what are they doing 
and what are they not doing? And, you know, and that brings me to what I was going to ask next is mm-hmm. we've certainly had presidents who bent, concealed and distorted the truth, but we've never had such a habitual liar in the White House. What kind of filter does the public need to have to deal with a leader who has such a blatant disregard for the facts? Well, I think the first thing everybody has to do, and I'm talking everybody, Republicans, Democrats, people in the Trump administration who aren't necessarily immediately inside the Oval Office, journalism, courts, religious institutions, civic institutions, the whole society has to look at the question of and support the idea that truth matters. There's no absolute truth with a capital T in politics, but there are facts, and facts properly vetted and examined have to be the bedrock of any argument. Now, this kind of, I wrote a whole book about how the country thrives on argument. It's called The 13 American Arguments, and it was a bestseller, and it's still used in colleges and universities, and I believe very much in the theory that argument is the essence of America. Uh, but facts are required, and so the first thing is we have to agree that facts matter, And after we agree on that, we have to look at the role of the president in undermining that theory and also in his devotion to stating the facts. Because at some point, as long as he's president, there's going to come a moment when the whole country is going to turn to him and needs to believe with certainty in the leadership of America in in, in a crisis. And that's going to be the president of the United States. Uh, It's a dangerous situation when we have a guy who's not really highly regarded for telling the truth in the White House. It's exacerbated by the fact that you look at his base and they think that the stock market went down under Obama. They think unemployment went up. So the truth doesn't matter to a lot of people in his base. And that's really disconcerting to me. Yeah, I think that Donald Trump has a lot of faith in the voters who supported him. He feels a bond with them. And so far, those people, at least according to the polls and the interviews we've been doing, are sticking with President Trump. And I think they will stick with him for quite a while. And he's going to go back and back and back to that base, fuel the emotions of it, fuel the loyalty of it, fuel the fears of it. But he can't govern with the support, however fervent, of 38, 40 percent of the electorate. He just can't do it. It's not doable. The Republicans won't hang with him in the Senate and the House, in the Senate especially, and the Democrats are going to be out for blood. There isn't a whole lot of good news coming out of Washington, just so it doesn't seem like we're only dwelling on the negative here. During his address to the joint session of Congress, Donald Trump actually appeared rather presidential, talking about reaching out and working together to find ways to solve problems, which, as we know, has not been the case up until now. Do you think this indicates an actual shift in perspective and positioning based on the mishaps and mistakes of the first 40 days in office? Or was it just teleprompter Donald sounding better than tweeting Donald for a night? No, I thought it was an important moment for Donald Trump and for the country. I think the question was, how would he handle and how would he approach literally being in the belly of the beast? In other words, when he was giving that speech, he had the press corps up behind him in the gallery. He was facing the so-called judges of the Supreme Court. He had the whole Congress in front of him. He had the diplomatic corps. He had a huge television audience. In other words, all of the institutions of traditional politics that he ran against, he was surrounded by. How would he deal with that? Would he be the rebel? Would he be the disruptor? Would he be the cowboy? Would he, to use wrestling terms, would he be the heel and be the bad guy, be the outlaw? Well, he chose not to do any of those things, and instead, for the most part, not only in terms of tone, but a lot of the substance, to be, uh, you use the term presidential, I would say normal, because, you know, a lot of progressives and liberals and Democrats were telling the media, don't you dare normalize Donald Trump. Well, that was Donald Trump's effort to normalize himself. And to a large extent, he succeeded. And I think there was a great relief in the country. The next day, the stock market went up 300 points, I believe. That's not coincidental. Now, there were some statements in that speech and some ways that he was going to the dark side again, basically uh, caricaturing immigrants as marauding murderers and, you know, that kind of thing. He did a lot. He did dabbled in some of that. But that was by far the most presidential moment he had, other than the very gracious acceptance speech that he gave on the 91. And by the way, that gracious acceptance speech, 
when nobody knew how he would handle it. That started the stock market rally the day after. I have to say, some parts of the speech, it kind of reminded me of one of those uh, vapid beauty queen contests where it's like, well, I want every problem to be solved and everyone, you know, all the hunger. And- yeah, well, of course. <laughs> well, but since the inaugural address was such a dark and foreboding speech, I thought, when you're president, you've got to give a little uplift, too. And I thought it was useful, but the rhetoric and the policies are still going to be problematic and controversial and difficult, not just for Democrats, but for some, if not a lot of Republicans, once you get into the details about immigration, about Obamacare, about tax cuts, about infrastructure, how you pay for infrastructure, and so on. All of that is ahead of us, and at the same time, there's going to be this split screen with the Russia story. It's not going to go away anytime soon, especially because Donald Trump has contemptuously refused to release his tax returns, which a lot of people surmise has to have financial information about loans uh, that somehow have money traced back to Russia. Is that true? We don't know. Uh, But we won't know for sure unless and until he releases those returns. So that's the state of play here today. All i got to say for journalism, it's an important time for us. It's an exhausting time. I got to say, I'm impressed by Donald Trump's energy. He's a 70 year old guy, and it doesn't feel to me that he thinks the presidency is too big a job for him to handle. And I think that is a good thing, whatever you think of his policies. No, I agree. And that was the final thing I was going to ask you. You know, I'm a cautious yet very determined optimist. Mm-hmm. Me too. And I like to ask every guest. So what's the good news, and what are some of the reasons that you think Americans should be hopeful about the future? Well, I'm a determined centrist. I think there has been an overreach in regulation in some respects. I'm an environmentalist like we all are, but yeah, has there been some administrative and regulatory overreach in, say, the EPA? Sure. I mean, some of the uh, water regulations are ridiculous, for example. So I think some of that corrosive correctiveness that Trump is doing as a businessman, don't forget he's the first pure businessman ever elected president. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's a good corrective. So I would say that's number one, the fact that he doesn't have governmental experience of any kind, including military, is not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. He will start a lot of debates. He is starting a lot of debates that are necessary in the country. Let's have the debate about the extent of regulation again. Let's have the detailed discussion about how to reform the tax code. We all want the economy to prosper. If he's got some good ideas to do it, and he says that he does, let's hear him, and I think that's to the good. So that's my positive note to end on. Well, you've been listening to our conversation with Howard Feynman, the global editorial director of the Huffington Post and former chief political correspondent, senior editor and deputy Washington bureau chief for Newsweek. Howard, thanks so much for appearing on the show, and I look forward to speaking with you again in the future. We'll do it. Thank you so much. So that's it for today. I'll see you on our next round of Practically Political, where we go beyond the deluge of everyday news to dive deeper into American politics. I'm Dave Spencer. Have a great week.